Hello, very beautiful community. Here is a talk um, for us about the debate on CNN between Trump and Biden. This is going to be long and I'll try to make it a really brutal and sometimes rough with you, but also gentle with you exercise in democratic self-reflection. You're so welcome if you've never seen me before, but this is really a talk for the community who's met me millions of times, especially as we're here on the second channel, on the chat channel. Before we get more serious, um, let me just make a very minor detail apparent to us, and that is that I'm unimpressed um, that CNN did not let non-conventional media stream um, the debate. And that's not because I am in the first instance upset that David Pakman or somebody else couldn't run the stream on their channel. It's because we live in a crisis of derivative consumption. We're increasingly consuming not events, but reactions to events and reactions to reactions to events. And that step of not letting it be streamed is not going to make people watch the debate more than is actually going to make people watch the commentaries without watching the debate. Um, in this particular context, people who don't see the debate at all will probably be spared if they support Biden. But that's another point to which we will get. Historically, you know my background on um, Trump in US politics. I felt Trump would win in 2016, but I felt it was close to 50-50. My recent remarks over the last couple of years have um, pointed to a Trump victory in 2024. And I sometimes say it's 50-50 edging to Trump. Sometimes I'd say it's 70% in favor of Trump. Using percentages not as real probabilities, but as psychological clues about roughly where we stand. Obviously, this debate made a contribution we shouldn't overestimate to how people are going to vote. But insofar as it made a minor contribution, it's going to be, as we will see, in Trump's favor. Trump is a post-truth authoritarian in the sense that, not in the sense that he wants to be a dictator and he fantasizes about being a dictator, although he has some such fantasies, but in the sense that he is a guy out to break the democratic game. So I do have a clear recommendation here, and that is that there are plenty of excellent conservatives, if you want to vote for a conservative, who you may be outraged by if you're in a different place in the political spectrum, but they're conservatives who are constitutional, they support the democratic game. They're not part of this crisis of conservatives when there are crises in the middle and crises in the center left. But the crisis on the right is a crisis of people on the right stopping being people on the right while remaining in the clothes of people in the right. So people are in the clothes of constitutional conservatives who are drifting toward the sensibilities of Viktor Orban. Trump's one of those him being elected is damaging for U.S. institutions. If you've seen the debate, you are either a bit biased to your side or hearing what you want to hear, or you feel really bad. That is the more realistic position in the sense of the debate um, wasn't close. It was an obliteration of Joe Biden by Trump. I'm going to make one more remark before we get to um, a breakdown. The format itself 
is highly damaging to democracy. I didn't count the number of lies Trump told, but they were more than I feel I'd be able to count on um, the fingers of two hands. You cannot have democratic discourse where lies are not challenged. It's not okay. And the reason we're doing it is because we're not used to post-truth politicians. Our democratic, ins our journalistic institutions are proceeding as though it's 1998 and politicians lie from time to time. Well, that's not the reality. We have now entrepreneurial politicians who lie a heck of a lot of the time, if not all the time. And then you've got post-truth politicians who don't just lie, but they try to um, disrupt the very distinction between truth and lies by letting go of the idea that even their lies should be coherent. That toxic post-truth politics doesn't have an answer from journalistic institutions. So what we've got is a dynamic in which Trump told a, an endless number of lies, but we do not have an institutional approach to how to handle it. We don't even have views about uh, how to handle it. And CNN does not have answers to my questions here. Right? There are no answers about what the protocol should be about all the lies, except perhaps that it should just shake out in the aftermath of the debate. And I'm saying you can't do that. If you've got a situation where routinely politicians tell 30 lies per hour, and they're not being challenged, something is wrong with the media formats we have. They need to be reformed. If I were a US citizen, and if I were a political animal in the sense of wanting to be a politician, and I'm a political animal in a very different way, I have no skills um, towards active political participation in the sense of leadership. But if I were somebody who I am not, and I were in Joe Biden's position, my approach would be to attack constructively, not just Trump, but the format. My dear Americans, we've created the dynamic that generates lie after lie after lie out of the mouth of this chap next to me former president. And here are three examples, because I have 17, but I'm going to give three about the lies he just told. And you've asked me a question, I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to change the subject, because this is existential for our democracies. If we just keep lying to ourselves about everything, give up on truth completely, we're not going to be able to help Americans who are suffering, Americans who are struggling with blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So that's how a young, democratically responsible, but also minorly and constructively populist politician would have handled this. Right? You, you had to push back against the format in order to push back against Trump because the format was set up to allow Trump, and this is not how we did this debate, this is that our media has no answers to post-truth politics. Right? Biden may have said some things that were wrong, but Biden is not a post-truth politician and nor is Biden an entrepreneurial politician. He might get carried away with um, pursuing power, with self-indulgence, but he's not an entrepreneurial politician. He, whatever else you think of him, he cares about responsible politics. That rant being over, let's get going. And this is going to be just porridge. Um, and um, you're going to bear with me, but in exchange, I'm going to try to hold you through by being gentle on you, but also telling you off about things. Now, if you feel bad, I think we need to realize that politics has ups and downs. 
and situations are fluid, that things that we feel catastrophic about are most of the time not catastrophic, they're just really bad. They're catastrophic for some people, but they're not cumulatively catastrophic for uh, the world or a whole country. This politics is something we've done ever since humans negotiated social space. Because what happened was that when humans began to negotiate social space, they had conflict and they began to ask questions. How do we resolve this conflict beyond just saying, I want this and you saying, I want that? Is there any sense of fairness procedure? Um, me asking something that's reasonable and me asking something that's unreasonable in a way we can both agree on, right? Politics is age old and human beings have endured for a, for a very, very long time. And so we, what we were witnessing is humans doing politics. The narrow historical context is that we have a wide crisis of trust in politics. And we have people losing trust in institutions in a way I won't re-legislate. Now you, you know about the um, for feelings of distrust that I always talk about, the worst of which is this feeling that your institutions are opaque. And we also have significant institutional failure, and we have an, a huge epistemic crisis where we, we can't agree on facts. And it's partly because of this that we had a debate um, where on the one side you had post-truth deception, and on the other hand, you had something I'll talk about a little bit more, cognitive decline. If the political system were institutionally healthier, neither of these candidates would be there. Biden would be there if he were eight years younger, but in his current condition, he wouldn't be there. So let's say a few words about in what context we might begin to mention Biden's cognitive decline. And there will be a minority of you who are skeptical that he has any, because he, you might think, has a history of a stutter, which he does. And that, that explains it combined with the cold that speculatively he had. And we'll talk about the politics around all of this. We'll talk about what I would do next and how you would spin it if you were Biden's team. And what you would do if you were Trump tomorrow to try to rub it in. But I have to put down my cards a little bit so that you understand where I'm coming from here. I don't, I've never seen Joe Biden in real life, but completely politics aside, um, he has some of my values. Biden is the kind of guy who would call you once a week if your child developed a disability and he would ask how you are, even if he's very busy. Most humans wouldn't. Um, Obama would be much less good at that than Biden. So I have a, a personal bias, but it I doesn't mean I can't call Joe Biden responsible, can't uh, uh, you know, hold Joe Biden responsible for um, the way he has timed the latter stages of his political career. There is then something else. Now, I cannot say that this, this would be true if he happened to win in November, but I can say that this is true from 2020 to 2024. Whatever you think of Biden's politics, whether his ideas about what should and shouldn't be done were right or horrific, let's be neutral about that. As a practical politician, while suffering from this significant cognitive decline that we'll discuss, Biden has proved effective. The ordinary voter cannot really see this. But Biden has proved a more effective practical politician than Barack Obama. 
And that includes while Biden was barely able to string two sentences together in public. Behind the scenes, he was being a slightly more effective politician than Barack Obama. So this is a paradox we've got. Now, I cannot guarantee, um, to say the least, that this would continue beyond 2024. But taking 2020 to 2024, I'm confident to say that in terms of practical politics, uh, Biden did better than most European leaders are doing in their country and uh, did better than some recent US presidents. So there, let's go on. No, let's go on sharing more about my, uh, my, my own prejudices. So I felt that it was a couple of years too late for Biden to run in 2020. I felt Biden would have beaten Trump in 2016. I still feel he would have beaten Trump in 2016. But I felt that Biden would lose in 2020 if the public health crisis hadn't happened globally. And Trump's mishandling of this created a, a window of opportunity. But as Biden entered the race, I was very concerned that he was far from the most plausible candidate to put out there to beat Trump. And I feel Biden gambled with the nation because of confidence in his own powers and a thirst for power. His confidence in his own powers, paradoxically, for all the things we will say about his cognitive decline, was accurate. He really thought, hey guys, I'm really good at this. I'm good at practical politics. But he also felt that he just needed to do, the, to do this in such a way that it wasn't available to him to say, the timing has gone against me, I'm going to step aside. So it, the way we analyze 2020 is up for grabs, but I think that Biden lucked out in not letting his party and the country down and actually being able to win. If Biden had come to me um, at the beginning of his first term, I would say, for the love of everything beautiful, do not run for the second term. But it's so late in the game now. If Biden steps down, Will a Democrat step in, and we'll talk in more detail about this at the end, so this is not what we're going to focus on right now, we'll just mention it briefly. Will a Democrat who steps in beat Trump this late? Right? And that is an enormous jump because it is enormously procedurally difficult for Biden to be um, sidelined now. And of course, is there a realistic chance of Biden stepping down? I believe not. But I think it's possible if the manifestations of cognitive decline continue to dramatize. If they asked me the following question, look, we've found a way of making it work. Biden has agreed to it if he's persuasively told that it's the right decision. Would you recommend him to step down or would you say it's now so late that he shouldn't? And my answer would be, if Kamala Harris were to replace Biden, he should not step down um, because Kamala Harris would overwhelmingly likely lose to Trump. Um, but if somebody could replace him who isn't Kamala Harris, even today, I would recommend for all the enormous difficulty of this that um, Biden... Um, let go of the second term. This is not realistic. Unless some more things happen which haven't happened yet, I do not believe this is a realistic scenario. But if 
in virtue of some magical machination, one of five or six people were parachuted in. We're purely talking about defeating Trump here. We're not talking about what we think of these different candidates. But let's say if you parachuted in Gavin Newsom, I'd say go for it. One of the technical challenges the Democrats had was the double camera angle where you were looking at Biden. And we'll get to talking about issues, but the, the trouble is, I mean, I've read my own notes from the debate and I've given several wins to Biden, but they are just battles in a bigger war that's been, the war of the debate that's been lost. So we'll have to talk about um, non-issue issues, I'm afraid, quite a lot. That really went against Biden because Biden um, had an open mouth and a glacial look in his eyes while Trump was speaking. And that didn't that will not play well with people subconsciously. And it even won't play well with people who don't come out and say anything about it, don't even speak about it to their families, but it have a subconscious impact. Um, that doesn't look robust enough for um, presidency. Weirdly, cutting the mic worked better for Trump. It kept a little bit better under control. Trump's um, impulse challenges. So with Biden, we're talking about cognitive decline. I think I'm entirely, entirely entitled to talk about that. Um, in fact, I'll tell us off about not wanting to talk about it, how, how democratically damaging that is. With Trump, it's harder. So I'm only going to say something speculative. I'm not going to discuss it much because under the circumstances, given his own challenges, um, he, he had a good night. Trump's challenges are obviously um, in two directions. One is a bad direction. One is is, is a magical brain direction. Um, the bad direction is narcissism, probably to a level of diagnosis. And then, um, because I don't know exactly how YouTube works with this at the moment, I'm just going to say spec speculatively, it's possible that some politicians have neurodiversity, whether it's ADHD or um, autism, and we need to talk about it. In Trump's case, it's not autism. Now, ethically, there is a challenge about talking pe about people's neurodiversity. In other words, if, you know, Bob Smith were a fellow YouTuber doing political commentary and Bob Smith had ADHD, it wouldn't be ethical for me to say that Bob Smith has ADHD. So where does this change? Um, unless Bob Smith talked about his ADHD open, then it'd be fine. The, the problem is that when it comes to political power, it absolutely has to be talked about. And that is where this widespread policy, sometimes is, is advocated in the neurodiversity community, is, is completely unacceptable, right? Because there's a conflict between pr privacy, respect, and public interest. So... Um, if uh, a newspaper columnist or a um, you know, content producer on a platform like this has a DHD, doesn't know it, you don't get to talk about it ethically. But if you're talking about a massively powerful person in political terms, whether they're a political leader, um, Liz Truss, Donald Trump, or just a hugely politically significant person like Elon Musk. And there is an interaction between the way they operate, right, in a very consequential way for people's lives and their neurodiversity. That connection must be publicly discussed, right? Um, uh, there is absolutely no question about that. Now, it would be unethical for... Um, a specialist to diagnose anyone by distance. And in fact, I think specialists probably shouldn't talk about this in public. But paradoxically, it is ethical for non-specialists to talk about it, especially if they speculate about it, especially if they um, have a lot of 
you know, uh, uh, respect for how complex it is to begin to to, to understand um, something like ADHD. Right? Now, I don't have any neurodiversity, but I know an enormous amount about b both um, autism and ADHD. We won't talk about this much in relation to Trump, because I don't think this came up. Cognitive decline before we talked about some issues. Now, for a couple of years of my life, I couldn't talk or read or walk for that matter, but that's a separate issue. And little by little, I began to read. So I have myalgic encephalomyelitis. I was you know, severe. Now I'm volatile, but I'm not severe, moderate. And um, I know so well what it's like when your brain's not working properly, right? In most of the chats that you're with me for, my brain's not working properly. Because if you go to the Vlad before illness, everything would be much more condensed, concise, there wouldn't be points going like this, and I'd be able to say, here are four things we need to understand, here are seven things we need to understand, and I'll evenly land on all within 15 minutes. Um, I don't dare do that, that would be a cognitively implausible bungee jump for me. So as um, articulate in some ways as I sound, when I'm talking to you on the cha channel, 70% of my, of my energy still goes on making sure my brain keeps ticking over rather than on the topic we're discussing. I'm there, I'm present, you can see that, but that's because I've learned how to be present while also um, playing these machinations in my head where if a certain connection isn't working, I find an alternative way to get there. So you're always sort of, you know, cycling while trying to stop the wheels from falling off. So that creates great empathy for me. Now, there are two looks in Joe Biden's eyes um, when he experiences um, his cognitive decline in a public situation. It's the look of fear and it's the look of arrogance. And it's not the terrible arrogance. I can tell you exactly what kind of arrogance it is. It's the arrogance of somebody who has been through so much practical politics that they feel, you know what, even me at 60%, I can do this. Yeah, I might struggle to string a sentence, or two, but I can do this. And what's more, looking at 2020 to 2024, in terms of behind the closed door practical politics, Biden is right about that. He is genuinely one of the most, in that period, one of the most effective politicians in the world, whether you like his politics or not. So there is this arrogance, oh, for goodness sake, I'm gassing out, but I can cognitively, I can still do this. Fear is that fear that often elderly people feel and people with cognitive decline of various types feel where they can't piece things together, right? So imagine Trump comes to a podcast and somebody gets out a... Uh, a weirdly shaped mug of water, puts it on the side. Trump may lose the plot while he is reacting to that scene. He might say, that's a great mug of water. Uh, there's a lot of water tonight in the sky. Big, big sky, very, very beautiful. I don't love it when it's so beautiful. I like sort of mixed weather for golf. Don, Donny, what has just happened? You saw the water and you're talking about whether you prefer, w how did we get here, right? I won't analyze how this happens for Trump, but even though he's lost the, the thread and the plot there, he is actually still freshly uh, reacting. It's just that his thought gets to here and the second thought begins to be articulated before that one is got to halfway through. With Biden on a bad day today, he will look at the mug, look back at the person, look back at the mug, look back at the person, and he will have fear that he can't coordinate processing the, the two things. And so he'll say, well, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to now not look at the mug, I'm going to look at the person. Okay, there's a mug there, but if I look at it, I'll, I'll get disorientated again. So it's that sense of fear 
in his eyes where he cannot follow what's happening, where he has to be very intentional about that, even intentional about how he brings a finger up to his eye to wipe it. He has to be intentional and say, okay, I'm going to be looking at Trump now. I'm looking at him. Okay, now it's going to be time for me to speak soon. Come on. Okay, let's see how this one goes. So, arrogance and fear. About 10 to 20 percent of people who are passionate that Biden should win. Um, obviously, I, I do believe it's ethical for me to talk about this, even though I'm not an American citizen, because this is democratic life we're talking about, really. But you would not be surprised that if I were an American citizen um, and um, uh, uh, you asked me what I feel in this election, obviously I would run through 11 walls to vote for Biden. But we've got to also reflect honestly on, um, you know, um, in de good democratic politics, reflect honestly on our house being in order. So there will be a small number of you who don't think that Joe Biden has dramatic cognitive decline. You will say it, it's the, you know, he was in the hot spot. Maybe it was a cold. And of course, he has had a historical status that's completely legitimate. And Obviously, that's very damaging to tell your political opponents because they'll feel very, very, very gaslit. But it's also really, really, really destructive democratic politics um, to not um, take seriously the reality of things on your side. I do think for a lot of you, it's going to be innocent. A lot of you who don't see Biden's cognitive decline, it's going to be a case of something I know terribly well from the world of musicology, which is just how much people hear what they want to hear in classical music. So I think a lot of you are going to be innocent, but I, I want to be really tough on you and say, think about it. It doesn't matter where you land, but think about it. Don't just sort of peruse the internet writing, I didn't see anything wrong with Biden. Just think about it. You know? If you have adult children, ask your children, ask your neighbors, you know, how they feel. Think about it. Don't reproduce slogans. It's a stutter. Because it does you no good. And it does your political opponents who you want to beat. No good. It does you no good in, in, in your dynamic with your political opponents who you want to beat. Biden knew how bad the first half was and he came out trying to ramp up the performance in the second half and that meant that the second half of the debate was slightly better for Biden. In the first hour of the debate, Biden fell to as low as 20% odds of retaining the presidency on Betfair, um, which is one of the major platforms for this sort of stuff. Um, as the debate went on, Biden climbed back up a little bit to about 25%. Biden did do better um, beyond the first half of the debate, particularly beyond the first half hour. Now, if I'm Trump tomorrow, and Trump won't do this, he's not capable of this, I don't think. But if I were Trump tomorrow, or if I were um, asked in some malign way to help Trump win, I'd do a compassionate speech saying, actually, the debate wasn't that bad. There were different views exchanged. But what above all I want to say is that I feel compassionate for the other guy. I felt he didn't have a good time. And I felt that he just doesn't have what he had before in his career. And I just want to be compassionate about that. I think we debated different issues. And, you know, let's forget about that. But I, I just, you know, I want to be compassionate and non-exploitative about the fact that my opponent has an issue.
luckily Trump won't do that. On the economy. Some of the things Biden said were better, but the expiration of sentences before they're completed and the long-windedness and blurriness and lack of clarity, something I'm myself reproducing in this talk, but not as bad as Biden did, I'm afraid. <sighs> Probably even things out, edging toward Trump until um, the first catastrophic uh, brain glitch that Biden had. Now, I hoped that there would be less than three b massive brain glitches. That turned out to be the case for Biden in the debate. But in between the glitches, the, the performance was really poor. He simply lost his trail of thought just early on in the debate, forgot the topic, tried to remember it, tried to reach for it again and again and again, but each time it was disappearing further into the distance. And then he said, we beat Medicare. And as, as he said, I think either that or some other thing that didn't go down well, Trump smirked with, with satisfaction that this was going his way. If you simply cut the debate down to the discussion of abortion, Biden just about won there. And by winning, um, I do not mean um, how, if I were a judge in the Oxford Union debating competition, how I'd score it. What I rather mean is um, if you got an audience of a thousand US citizens that are really demographically representative, how would it go down? Because, um, l l let's be honest, um, that's what matters. It doesn't matter how I receive all of this. How I receive all of this is, is if this is happening in my country, I'm going to vote for the guy who's not going to be out to break democratic institutions <laughs> as long as he's alive. Um, but that it's not about me or you it's about this thousand people that's what we're discussing and i think when they got to immigration trump had perhaps the single most powerful line of the debate he said i don't know what he just said and you could actually see that trump genuinely didn't know what biden just said he wasn't just making this up he wasn't doing his you know uh, an addition to his sack of 77 lies and I don't think he does either. I don't know what he's just said, and I don't think he knows what he's just said either. That was the most powerful line of the whole debate. Now, Trump's issue-driven strategy was actually immigration, immigration, immigration. He kept bringing every single issue that he could back to immigration. So you can't isolate the issue of immigration as far as Trump's comments go just to the particular segment of the debate. Then they got to foreign policy. Biden said what, uh, Trump said what he usually says, Putin would have never invaded. Um, and some other populist talking points. And Biden began to make a good point. about Putin and the security threat that Putin presents. Unfortunately, he got Trump and Putin confused. And that point didn't land. He said Trump when he meant Putin, and then Putin when he meant Putin, but then again, I think Trump when he meant... At least once, possibly twice, he said, uh, I believe, Trump in, when he meant Putin. And that's fairly obvious. I got that. But that made the point not land. Who invaded what? How? Trump invaded? What? what? So that, that didn't work. Trump said Putin's terms were not acceptable. 
Biden said Putin won't stop. And began to elaborate on that point, and again, his words petered out. Biden's most powerful gambit here is, he said, do you want to pull out of NATO? Trump wants to pull out of NATO. And he looked at Trump, and that was a very powerful point, somewhat diminished by the fact that Trump, that Biden, as he turned to Trump, had to focus on his own posture, his own eyes, his own gesticulation, that he was trying to keep that under control, because balancing all of that is hard for him. In my notes, I actually have the Trump smirk at Biden's mind failing him in the opioids, op opioids section. Then we got to the democracy section and again in isolation Trump lost that, maybe depends on how you cut that section, um, but his defense of January 6th you know, if you're a serious Trump campaign person, that defense of January 6th was selfishly counterproductive for Trump. Which is absolutely insane, given that he's already winning the debate to do that. Biden's best line was that at that point he turned to Trump and with just about enough clarity said you have the, the morals of an alley cat. Then Trump delivered his second most powerful line. He's not equipped to be president. You know it, and I know it. Then we dealt with climate change, child care, um, voter concerns, and again, counterproductively, Trump here began to deny election results. Then there was an exchange of golf, and Biden... And this is not a big self-own relative to the rest of the debate. But Biden said, I can play you if, if, if you want the arc, I can play you. And of course, that's not what Biden should have said. Biden should have said, you know, I'm not in a season of my life where I do physical challenges. I do practical politics to keep the country safe and keep the country moving forward. You know, I'm wise and I get things done behind the scenes. Golf's 10 years ago for me. This is a catch-22. It's very sad that the Democratic Party is presenting Biden to us in this, in this state in the middle of a democratic crisis. But... Democratic crisis isn't crisis of democracy, not crisis of the party. Separate conversation. But it's also because there's a democra democratic crisis that we have a situation where that's what's put up against Trump. And let's get this really, really clear. Trump's a communicator of genius. He's an extraordinarily weak politician. And by that I mean he's a weak destroyer of democracy. That's to say that Putin's analysis of Trump's first term is roughly correct, that Trump failed to get things done behind the scenes, build an elite around him that would actually do as much damage to democracy as he would have liked. So Trump is child's play post-truth populism compared to the post-truth populism we're going to have to deal with 10 years from now, because we're going to get much... Um, more rigorous and dogged and disciplined and hard-nosed politicians trying to break our democracies then. Today, we are in a wave of buffoons. There, there's not going to be an endless wave of, of populist post-truth buffoons. There's going to be also a wave of hard-nosed populist people who are systematically out to muzzle the courts, muzzle the media and so on. So, 
easier said than done, but the world's biggest democracy should be putting up many candidates who can obliterate Trump. And quite frankly, I do believe there are several people in the Democratic Party against whom you could level a thousand criticisms who would who would fairly comfortably beat Trump. But they're not there. I do think that there's going to be a lot of panic in the Democratic Party now. There's already panic. There should have been more panic before because this performance was not a surprise. But now there is going to be this conversation also about what it means, not just for now, but for 2027. Because the Biden of 2016 wasn't the Biden of 2012. The Biden of 2020 wasn't the Biden of 2016. And the Biden of 2024 is not the Biden of 2020. So where are we going to be three years from now? If you want Biden um, at the very end of being near his best, watch his speech for Hillary Clinton in 2016, which ends with, we are America. We own the finish line. That was still Biden at his best. It was actually one of the best political speeches in recent American history. How do the Dems turn it around? Well, I can tell you what they're going to do, and it's going to be terrible. They are going to say that Biden won. And in fact, as I'm taping this, I bet they're saying this. And they're not going to say that anything is wrong. And they're going to say Trump's a terrible liar and Biden won. And we're back to gaslighting citizens, gaslighting your political opponents. Here's what I would do. I would absolutely say he had a cold. And I would have leaked that he had a cold before the event. The cognitive decline isn't just something we could put down to the cold, so we, we, we really don't want to go there. But there, there's plausibly cold in, in, in at play. I would have leaked it before, and I would have um, I would center it now. And I'd also say, you know, when the cameras are on him, sometimes he looks bad. Behind the scenes, it's much better. It's really good, but you're admitting. You're admitting what people are seeing. I'd mention the stutter, but I wouldn't put it down to the stutter. And I'd mention cognitive decline without using these terms. I would say, you know, the president is, is amazing at doing X, Y, Z behind the scenes. In public, he sometimes doesn't perform well. And we know that. And I would get others, not Biden, out there to get to defend his performance in that way of conceding the reality, but then emphasizing that we've got a post-truth populist and that Biden's effective behind the scenes. What about the second debate? How would I handle that? Obviously, I would not want the second debate to happen, but it would have to happen. So, um, if the Biden campaign came to me and said, what are we going to do? Um, do you have any tips for the second debate? If you know, Jen O'Malley, Dylan or somebody came to me and said, look, what are we going to do? I would say... Biden has to stop being arrogant about operating within his cognitive limits. So if you can't run a mile, run 200 meters in how you speak, right? I mean, I have adjusted my own speech since my, um, you know, um, neurological illness. And I 
regularly fail to adjust my own speech well, right? So I've got to be speaking about this with humility. A good example is um, a, a recent visit to the lovely Jake Bro with um, Anna from Ukraine and John from Silicon Curtain. Um, if you happen to have seen this, think of how, and you remember all, all of us there, in the first 10, 15 minutes, I was very dialogical. Hey guys, good to be here. Nice. And then I became lectury. And that's because my, my, my physical symptoms actually got worse, not just, not just my cognitive symptoms. But I, I, my, my, my health got worse and I became less able to be interactive when I was a little bit more in my own bubble, too much. So I constantly mishandle my health and how I communicate. I always try to do better. I always learn. And one thing I'm very grateful for is that I never feel pain when I, you know, um, communicate in a way that very much lets down the important thing I want to communicate um, because I, I, I do a bad job. I feel, I feel no pain about that ever. Um, I remember once I presented a chapter, I think for my PhDs almost 20 years ago, and it was one of my first sort of times out in, in the real world, as it were, after being neurologically and physically knocked out. And I simply couldn't defend um, the philosophical account I'd given in that presentation in a way that you know, w would have taken me no effort at all before the illness. Um, I needed to say things like, I'm going to, have to take a day to get back to you on this. And at the time, I was also just a kid still in my, in my if this is what, 20 years, I was still in my 20s. So, you know, that was incredibly painful to me for 24 hours. Then I got over myself. Um, and I feel no pain now, but I always screw it up. But what I do do is I try to adjust. I never say... Um, here are seven points I want to make, and then on minute 12, I arrive at the second, seventh point. So Biden needs to contract this. He needs to speak in smaller sections. He needs to stop trying to remember three things at the same time. And he needs to say, you know what, this big point I can't make, I'm going to make a smaller point instead. And he doesn't do that. He, he somewhat arrogantly still just slides out there and then we realize that you know his car is not set up for the for the terrain he's in and he just got stuck and he's like, oops i got stuck no joe you have to now realize that there's certain terrain you can't go into with the vehicle you have and i'm sure i could have 20 tips for him about how to do that but that's the direction in which i would go but the messaging now from the Dems, you know, if you're going to be politically strategic, should be actually yes, Biden had a a bad night, but it's an effective he's an effective leader, and um, I'd frame it like this: because Biden had a bad night, he wasn't able to address Trump's endless lies as effectively as he would have liked. That would be my my message. But you can't say that Biden won because that is democratically unconstructive. Now, I don't think I have much confidence that I've balanced this in a way that helps you enough. But um, maybe you've got something out of this breakdown. Um, thank you so much for being with me. And again, this is worth saying, even though you've heard me say it a million times. And the point is that I, I want you to hear me say it a million times. From the point of view of the climate crisis, it's bad, but it's not the end of the world if Trump wins. From the point of view of Ukraine and Western security, it's really bad if Trump wins, but it's not as bad as the most catastrophic predictions about the consequence of Trump winning, partly because Trump will be significantly co-opted, a bit less because he's now wanting to get around this in a way he didn't have the skills for at the beginning, but he still doesn't have the skills for it. So Trump will be really bad news for Ukraine, but it won't be as bad news. No, I can't say that. The reasonable expectation is that Trump will not be as bad news for Ukraine as the worst case predictions. And on democracy, it's bad, 
but it's not a reasonable expectation to think that Trump will break or end U.S. democracy. U.S. democracy is the sickest major democracy in the world, but it is one of the most institutionally resilient. Right? It's a sick but great democracy. So what we want to do is acknowledge crisis, but not make it apocalyptic. Acknowledge crisis, but not make it terminal. Right? So we're out. I'm so sorry I'm doing this again. We're out in the open water. It's patchy. It's wobbly. Things are going to fly off our boats. A couple of people could even fall off. There's going to be structural damage. But the boat is not going to be at the bottom of the sea. It just won't. So... It's very important to keep that perspective that crisis is not collapse. And of course, there's still a reasonable possibility because politics is politics that Biden wins in 2024. But from where we sit now at the level of expectations and setting expectations, um, Trump is not a marginal but a strong, strong favorite um, in, in November. And um, I know there's going to be a lot of people who feel that that's nonsense, that Biden is overwhelmingly the favorite. And all I can say to you is I'm, I'm going to be here for you, you know, after November, if it's not the outcome that um, you want, if it's a destructive outcome for U.S. democracy. Um, not that Biden would be a constructive outcome for U.S. democracy. It's just a much better outcome. The trouble we've got with democratic decline is because it's so socially systemic, almost anything any politician does risks causing more decline in trust. Um, so it's a very difficult challenge. It's almost like putting something through the eye of a needle, how to do politics without that trust continuing to drop, 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 drop. Uh, because we're almost in a dynamic where you do the right thing, it drops, you do the wrong thing, it drops, you do something else, it drops, you do nothing, it drops. I don't believe it always has to drop, and I certainly don't believe that we have no influence over this. I think we can dramatically slow that um, democratic deterioration. And uh, a lot is up to us, and we don't, we don't want to turn into a depoliticized blob here. Um, forgive me if I haven't given you enough or have given so much that none of it is of value. But I, 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 I um, as Jack Nicholson said, at least I tried. Lots and lots of love till next time.